here's some history that I love, local history about James Mann in like Macquarie Fields, MacArthur. So if you don't like history, that's cool, move on. But I love it. So I'm sure someone out there would also be interested. So James was actually born in Ireland in 1774. And in 1798, he joined the Irish Rebellion and became a prisoner. He got caught. I think he was one of the organisers. And I believed he had a wife at this point as well. Not sure about children, but he ended up being sentenced and shipped to Australia on friendship in 1800. The documents show that his name was actually James Mohon. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, and I'm not sure why it changed as well. Anyways, within two months, he was an apprentice for Charles Grimes, who was the general surveyor. So he and Charles travelled, like, everywhere, just, like, mapping out what is, like, New South Wales, Tasmania. I think they went to North Folk Island as well. Like, they were, you know, doing their thing, surveying and stuff in, I think it was, like, 1806 he did the Aids area which is now known as MacArthur um so he mapped out all the trails that John Warby had traveled through like and also granted or like mapped out surveyed the land for John MacArthur as well as Camden um and then in 18 sorry keep saying and then in 1806 he was given a pardon, so he was like a free man, no longer a convict. Uh, but he kept surveying, kept kept working along with Charles. Actually, Charles went back to England for a brief period of time, for like three years, because he was unwell, and James continued doing the work, which is why he was pardoned, actually, now that I think about it. So in 1809, Governor Macquarie actually granted him 340 acres in Minto, uh, but... He then took it, took that back and gave it to Dr. William Redfern. And Redfern Cottage is still up. It's like behind Minto Moor. Anyway, um, all that was going to go to James Meehan, but it ended up going to Dr. William Redfern because John MacArthur uh, requested. He used his influence to be like, hey, actually, Dr. William saved my daughter um, and I promised him land. Can you give it to him? <laughs> I don't know if that was actually how it went, but kind of maybe. Uh, so in 1810, Governor Macquarie ended up giving him 1140 acres of Macquarie Fields, right? Now, he was going to call it Thomas Town after his only son, Thomas. So he had two children with Ruth, Thomas and Mary. Mary, unfortunately, passed away at 13 and Thomas at 27. But anyways, he wanted to call it Thomas Town. And it has to be reviewed by the governor, which was Macquarie. And he was all like, nah, you know what sounds good, though? Macquarie Fields. So that's how it got the name Macquarie Fields. So in 1812, uh, James almost became the general surveyor um, for New South Wales. But it ended up going to John Oxley, who was also like someone to talk about in MacArthur at another time. Anyway, I don't think those two got along at all. So John was a Navy officer. Um, and his main reason for wanting the job over James, who had the experience, is James is Irish and was a prisoner. Now, the prisoner part does have more merit than being Irish, but he did really push the Irish part. I don't know what it is with English and Irish. They're, like, next to each other, but they didn't like each other. Um, the British government agreed. They were like, yeah, we're going to give it to the British guy. Sorry. Um, but it wasn't like John was bad. It was just, like, James was better. Anyway, James continued to be the preferred surveyor, continued surveying things. I think John ended up going up to Queensland and kind of surveying Brisbane and stuff like that. While that was happening, James was still down here surveying lands and stuff. He was getting closer to retiring, and in 1819, he ended up mortgaging Macquarie Fields to the Bank of New South Wales for £500. And in 1820, he leased out the Macquarie Fields house to Reverend Thomas Randall, who turned it into a school, right? So Macquarie Fields was this up-and-coming place. Now, by this stage, Macquarie Field had grown, and uh, James had leased out uh, little farmlets to people to grow things and stuff. It was like a thriving place, as well as having this elite school, boarding school, which is kind of like, like still almost an education area because you've got Helston at that same land now. So it's like Helston Agricultural School, which is still a boarding school. I think it's moving to Windsor soon, though. 
Anyway, James passed away in 1826 and he left everything to his only surviving child, which was Thomas, who was 18 at the time. Now, Thomas had married Mary um, from Appen and they had two children together, but they didn't get the actual inheritance until John was, oh, sorry, until Thomas was 21. Okay, so who was looking after that in that meantime? Well, it was actually Dr. William Redfern. Um, and unfortunately, by the time Thomas turned 21, for some reason, it was just debts. Uh, and it was documented that it was because Thomas didn't know how to manage the farm. But that can be very heavily debated because he wasn't allowed any kind of management over his inheritance until he turned 21. Anyway, it was super sad. Thomas uh, ended up having to sell off all the family land, everything. Um, and I think a lot of it went to Terry... Samuel Terry. So Thomas and Mary lost everything. They lost everything that James had built uh, in his one lifetime. And it was such a shame because it was such a thriving place before then. And it can be speculated a lot of it was just because the heritage of being Irish. So this stress broke Mary. She was so young. She had two infant children, two Thomas, right? I think they'd only been married for two years. So she was still almost a teenager and she got committed to a Liverpool Liverpool asylum until her death and then Thomas ended up being the postmaster of Campbelltown until his death at 27 right 27 years old and they left two infant children which I believe top Reverend Thomas Randall raised now I'm not saying that the ghost of James Mann cursed Macquarie Fields after that but this was a thriving place while James had it, right? And uh. so Samuel Terry, who had purchased it from Thomas, he passed away in 1838, so not that long afterwards, and he left it to his daughter Martha. Um, but Martha ended up moving to Hilltop because she got married to John Hopskin, who was the first mayor of Sydney, by the way, another little clink like of MacArthur and Sydney. Um, yeah, but she ended up living in, in Hilltop. Now, in 1860, the Macrofield House, it was still used as a school. Like, that whole land area was still used as a school, um, but just by different people. Then enters Thomas uh, Saywell, or Sawwell. Uh, he was a tobacconist, so he wanted to kind of grow tobacco on that land, and it did not work out at all, like he went broke uh, and William Pritchard was kind of involved in that and it just didn't work out for either of them anyway William Pritchard ended up going up back towards Liverpool which isn't too far away but so in 1883 William Phillips brought up a lot of Macquarie Fields and he wanted to kind of make it this elegant country home which he called Glenwood which is I think is now known as Glenfield um, and it, he did quite well because it was Again, becoming a bit of a thriving place, uh, a lot of bushlands, the river, it was beautiful. A lot of city gentlemen wanted to move out into the country and kind of back and forth and in Glenwood or Glenfield was a perfect location for that. And then the opening of the two stations, Glenfield and Glen Macquarie Fields, just made it way more successful. Uh, and then that kind of came up to the Denham Court Estates as well. And some of the roads are still there to this day. So you've got Victoria Road, um, you've got Parliament Road, uh, you've got First Avenue, Second, Third, Fourth, Fifth and Sixth Avenue. Imaginative. Anyway, it was doing really, really well. And then the war happened and depression happened and it didn't do too well after that. So water and electricity ended up being connected to Macquarie Fields in 1938. But during the Great Depression, Macquarie Fields had actually become a refuge for homeless and those in despair. There was so much vacant land in the area. It was either farms or bush, and it wasn't cleared farm as well. So it was just vacant land. There was a lot of makeshift uh, huts and things like that. So that was kind of where Macquarie Fields was heading during the Depression. In 1944, uh, the Department of Agriculture kind of stepped in. They were very interested in Macquarie Fields because... It's land. It's land. It's still in Sydney. Um, and so they were kind of wanting to do animal studies and things like that. Uh, and they wanted to knock down Macquarie Fields House at that point. But the National Trust said, no, you can't knock that down. We're going to restore it. And that's what happened. They ended up restoring the house. 
1958, a few houses were being built in Macquarie Fields, which was very exciting for the times for because, I mean, the more people, the more infrastructure can come to the town. Uh, and there's a newspaper about it in Campbelltown Library, and I can't quite remember, but, yeah, it was, people were pretty exciting, excited about it. Yeah, so there were three modern shops and a shopping centre. They were very, they were very excited. Oh, and a doctor! There you go. So that happened in the 50s for Macquarie Fields. And Macquarie Fields School opened in 1958. In the 60s, the government decided to make Macquarie Fields into a housing estate. And there was someone called George Hudson uh, who built 60 homes in Waddle Avenue, right? So the first 60 homes in Waddle Avenue, and it was like a huge success for the time. So that just kept, uh, continued growing, um, which was great because then Macquarie Fields got a lot of infrastructure, including a sewage plant in the Macquarie Fields. Um, and that was in the 70s. And a really fun thing about that, was that when they were building the sewage plant in Macquarie Fields in that bushland, they came across animal tracks that were kind of in the clay. And they were like his historical animal tracks, which was believed to be a crocodile, um, which is crazy because you don't get them here like now. They're more tropics. So, but they do believe this was like 200 million years ago. But how great was that? Like they were finding all these things in Macquarie Fields just near that riverbank. Like, it was incredible. There were so many fossils, so much Aboriginal kind of artwork and stuff. I don't know if it's still there now, though. Um, I do believe that the sewage plant did kind of look after a part of it, but this was back in 1970. Okay, I just read that they did actually concrete over that, so... Anyways, in the 70s and 80s, private houses start popping up in Macquarie Fields, and it kind of changed the landscape again. Anyway, I'm bored of the topic. 